Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is the founder and CEO of the Play Therapy Institute of Colorado and the creator of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Welcome everyone to this episode from the Lessons from the Playroom podcast and webinar series. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into our topic for this episode, which has to do with understanding sensory processing issues. Now, I think that this is a topic that um, many people feel really confused about. It's a, a misunderstood topic, and it's actually something that's quite common, more common than I think that Um, we are aware of, and it does show up in the playroom, and we may not even be aware that that's actually what we are seeing. Now, in the next 20 minutes or so, there's absolutely no way that I can give this topic justice. This is a topic that is worthy of hours and hours and hours of discussion and study. So really what I'm going to do in this podcast is just orient you to this topic and give you a little bit of information and insight with the hopes that you'll actually go and study more and learn more. I do think that this is a topic that play therapists need to study actually in in depth. As I said, it shows up in the playroom a lot more than I think that we are um, aware of. So After this um, episode, I hope you feel inspired to go study this, take classes on it, um, really verse yourself. Also, if you are interested in the concept of regulation and co-regulation, understanding sensory processing issues is really a must because really sensory processing has to do with the ability for the body to regulate the sensory stimuli through the different senses. And some of the issues that we see with children are actually processing issues. So they struggle to regulate, not because they don't want to regulate, but because they literally can't regulate. And so our understanding of what might be going on for them as they are um, working to integrate their experience, their sensory experiences, actually is a really important piece of the puzzle for us to understand how to help them with regulation and how to engage in co-regulation with um, with these children. So with that said, um, sensory processing disorder um, is also known as sensory integration dysfunction. You'll hear about it in from different people depending on um, you know, how they are approaching the subject and if they're talking about old terminology or new terminology, but sensory processing disorder is also called sensory integration dysfunction. Um, A really simple way to understand this, and and I really like this way, it's really simple. It's the inability to use information received through the senses in order to function smoothly in daily life. One of the ways that I like to conceptualize this is if you think about every one of our senses having their own window of tolerance and you can be in your window of tolerance, you can be outside your window of tolerance, but when we're outside of our window of tolerance for whatever reason, we're not able to integrate and process so well. And I think that understanding sensory processing disorder in some ways is like that that as the sensory experience of the child is um, coming in, their information that they are receiving through their senses, if, if it's not able to come in in a way that's within their window of tolerance, 
It's not able to be organized in a particular way that it actually in, gets in the way of them being able to function smoothly, to be able to respond accordingly and to behave even, I'm going to use the word appropriately, but not in a moral or social context, but according to the function of the body, that the body's not able to do um, what it was designed to do in an optimal in an optimal way. Another thing that I hear, I, I hear people talk about sensory processing issues um, in, in kind of this like, oh yeah, I've got sensory issues, or yeah, my child's got sensory processing issues. And, and really, um, sensory processing disorder or sensory integration dysfunction is not one specific disorder. It's actually an umbrella term that really covers a lot of different struggles or a lot of um, neurological disabilities for a child. And so to just say, oh, I've got sensory issues or I've got sensory processing struggles really doesn't give a lot of information about what's actually going on inside of the child. So um, I really want you to get that as one of the understandings of this podcast, that it's really an umbrella term that's used um, to cover a whole range of things that can be going on. And I'm actually gonna go through the categories for you just so that you can get an understanding of how complex and how broad um, this term actually covers. Um, back to what I was saying around you know, when the child isn't able to process or integrate the information well, they it's really challenging to behave and we can talk about it as like a meaningful or a consistent way. Um, the child often has difficulty like planning and carrying out actions that he needs to do or she needs to do. Really for a lot of these kids it impacts their ability to learn, impacts their ability to follow direction. Um, because again, the system is really disorganized. You might even think of the child with SPD having a disorganized brain. And then therefore, you know, if you think about this way, if my brain is disorganized, well, then of course, aspects of my behavior are also going to be disorganized as well. Um, so sometimes, and actually I'm not going to say sometimes, I'm going to say a lot, sometimes, uh, or a lot, these children's behaviors are really misunderstood and really misdiagnosed. And I'll talk about that at the end, that sometimes these kids are getting labels or their behaviors are being judged or categorized in a way that's not accurate. It's really the result of a sensory processing issue, not um, a child not wanting to be compliant or having a conduct issue or something like that. It, it's not because the child um, won't. It's legitimately because the child can't. And I think that that's important for us to understand with, um, with sensory processing issues. So let's talk a little bit here about the categories of um, sensory processing disorder, also known as SPD, by the way, just for short, as I use SPD in this um, conversation. So again, just so you can appreciate the, the scope and just how, how big of a topic this really is. So the first um, area where a child can struggle has to do with sensory modulation problems. So sensory modulation problems. So some of the telltale signs of SPD have to do with um, difficulties with touch, with movement, with body position. And so with that, there are really three main types of sensory modulation. And when you think about modulation, Go back to that concept I just shared of the window of tolerance. As the sensory data is coming into that to the sense, um, the ability for that the the child to modulate to be able to integrate that sensory data, and there can be three problematic um, uh, problems with the modulation. The first has to do with an over responsiveness. So this is a child where um, where it's too much. So the modulation is it's it's too much. They get overwhelmed by the sensory experience. So this child, a really classic one, um, you can see with children with auditory sensitivity. So this is a child who puts their hands over their ears 
or maybe in school seems highly distracted by sounds and noises. What may register or may even not register for us. So for example, a sound in the in in let's say there's a fan in a room and the fan is on really low and it's for um for the average person they're able to block out that sensory experience and it just sort of fades into the background. But for a child who has um over responsiveness to auditory stimuli, you know, that may that sound of that fan may sound so loud, just the continually loud sound. So imagine learning when you have what sounds like a really loud fan in your ears. It's really challenging. So these children, the over-responsive child, um, they tend to avoid stimulation. They seek out less stimulation. So they can avoid being touched. They can avoid auditory input. They can avoid certain movements or being unexpectedly moved. Um, they be can become really rigid, um, trying to avoid sensory stimulation. Um, uh, a really classic example of this would be a child who is crying because they can't stand the feeling of the socks on their feet or their shoes are so tight um, they everything feels scary to the child. Everything feels miserable to the child from a sensory, right, from a sensory perspective. Um, the child who absolutely hates the feeling of sand, hates the beach, maybe hates water, hates the feeling of the water in the bathtub, refuses to wear certain clothing um, even when it's really cold outside. Maybe the child who avoids um, certain textures in the mouth. Um, child that avoids painting, messy activities. So, um, and by the way, sometimes this child is the best block builder ever. And they are amazing at puzzles. And they're really amazing at putting things together in a really organized, um, structural way. But let's look at that in the playroom. If we're going directive with the child and we're not aware that a chi this child has um, a, an over-responsive system to sensory stimuli or some sensory stimuli and we ask the child to create something with clay um, or we ask the child to create something in the sand and we may be inadvertently and unaware in an unaware way asking the child to do something that the child um, doesn't feel comfortable doing because of a sensory struggle. And then we may get feedback from the child and then we may call that child resistant or not wanting, you know, not wanting to do it in some way, not recognizing that, again, it's not because the child doesn't want to, they can't. Their sensory system is saying, no, 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 no. So there's implications for that um, in the playroom. So just be aware of that when you have a child that is um, not wanting to uh, approach maybe some of the different sensory experiences and, and just get curious about why that may be. This child may never put their hand in the sands. Uh, maybe they do at some point, but they may never put their hand in the sand if it feels uh, too much for them. Okay, the other one, or another one, is sort of the opposite. And this is the under-responsive child. So this is the child where the sensory experience almost doesn't even register in their system. And so this is the child that seeks out more stimulation. So this is the child that may be unaware that they have uh, a mess going on. They may be uh, unaware that they have, um, you know, food on their face or that they have stuff all over their hands or clothes, may not be aware of how things feel, may not be able to actually track certain um, sensations. They may not even notice um, things being moved. Um, another one is they may just, it may seem like they lack like an inner drive to move for the play. Um, but here's a really interesting thing. Once they receive some sensory, um, experiences like pushing or pulling or lifting and their system actually, they get that stimulation. Now all of a sudden they're able to join or jump in. Um, but they almost like lack the motivation until their system receives sensory input and then they're able to uh, to engage. 
So this is a child that um, you might even think they they lack like they lack some oomph. Um, they uh, and then they become livelier after engaging in sensory experiences. Um, I know I mentioned like pushing and pulling and lifting, but also you might notice the kid then starts rocking on all fours or hanging over the edge of the bed or swinging, and then they all of a sudden are able to engage in the in the in the different activity. So they need more they need more stimulation. So we have over responsive and we have under responsive. So again, in as far as the playroom goes, the child that won't initiate. Sometimes it's because of anxiety. Sometimes it's because of what we just talked about. So again, like I said, this, you can probably even hear in this conversation, there's an incredible amount of study that is um, so worthwhile to really understand what this presentation looks like and to be able to understand how this shows up so that we can identify this in a play process or in the playroom. So I'm just giving you those those little like insights just to get your mind thinking and um, what this whole podcast series is about is for you to create conversation within yourself and amongst your colleagues. Okay, the next one in terms of sensory modulation then is um, the sensory craver. So the sensory craver, this, this is the daredevil. This is the kiddo that runs fast, um, constantly is spinning, moves constantly, loves getting into upside down positions, craves bear hugs, squeezes, being pressed. Um, they crave it, they crave it, they crave it. Um, they also um, uh, really like, I think I just mentioned this one, but like they love fast movement. Um, I mentioned that these kids are often the, the daredevils. Sometimes these kids almost seem like they have no, uh, no fear. But they are also touching things a lot, um, rubbing against walls, bumping into people. I had a child that I worked with in a play therapy process, and this was one of his struggles. And um, this presentation was really challenging for his parents because he was always touching things. So even when he came into my office, he would touch everything. So he would go over to my desk and he would want to, he'd touch my pens. He would um, touch my papers. He'd want to move things around. He'd try to open, um, open drawers, opening up um, cabinets, but touching, 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 touching. When we would transition out of the playroom back to the waiting room, he would rub his hands up and down the, the walls in my, um, in my hallway to make his way out to the waiting room. So just touching things at school, he would, he was touching things all the time. He was craving sensation. Um, and, um, this was a big conversation with his parents to help him understand that, you know, just telling him stop touching. Um, it, it, there was a part of him that needed to touch for the sensory experience. And so we were able then to talk about and translate how could we create things or ways for him to touch things, um, putting objects in his hands that he could move and play around with so he could get that stimulation was actually a big part of his success in the play therapy, in the play therapy process. Okay, so those were the sensory modulation issues. Um, the, the next two, um, are sensory discrimination and sensory based motor problems. So sensory discrimination problems have to do with, um, the, the difficulty in, um, how can we talk about this? Distinguishing one sensation from another or in understanding what a sensation means. So for example, a child not being able to tell the difference between temperatures, different temperatures, or a child not being able to understand or distinguish um, salt, salty versus um, sugary versus vinegar, or even then soap um, for that matter. Um, uh, being able to confuse, they confuse sounds, or um, even things in sight can get confused, likenesses and, and differences. Um, also, things having to do with movement and balance and body position, muscle, muscle control. So, for example, um, being able to tell 
if you're holding your arms out um, at different lengths, which arm is out longer than the other arm. And um, like if your eyes are closed, can't really distinguish, um, can't distinguish how fast you're moving. Um, hard to distinguish, you know, if you're in a car, is the car moving um, or is the car next to you moving faster? It's just those kinds of things. So there's a difficulty in distinguishing the different sensations um, from one another. And then the last one is the sensory based motor problems. And within this, so by the way, already notice how complex this is and, and what happens if you have sensory struggles through more than one sensory channel, if it's not just auditory, what if it's auditory and taste? What if it is um, touch and sight? Um, what if there's with movement? I mean, it can become so complex, which um, I'll talk a little bit about what we what we can do and how we can get support if we're noticing this in the playroom. But the sensory based motor problems, um, there are two in here, postural disorders um, and something called dyspraxia. So postural disorders involve um, problems with movement patterns, balance, bilateral coordination, so using both sides of the body together. So this has to do with, you know, being able to jump, um, being able to, oh, sorry, that's dyspraxia. So, sorry, balance and um, bilateral coordination. So being able to stand, for example, on one foot and then stand on another one, being able to keep your balance in certain ways. Um, being able to do movements that uh, cross the cross the midline, and then dyspraxia is sort of like putting it all together. So being able to jump, being able to perform a coordinated activity like tying my shoes or zipping up my coat, um, being able to do um, different coordinated activities that include also like gross motor planning, fine motor planning. So it's like it's like the system being able to put it all together and then not being able to coordinate all the all the different um, movements. And we see this. We see this. We see kids that are clumsy. We see kids that aren't able to perform tasks in um, in certain ways. Okay, so the last thing that I want to say about this has to do with um, look-alike symptoms. So really part of why I'm putting this on your attention is that a lot of kids that actually have SPD um, are diagnosed with other things like um, ADHD, learning disabilities, poor auditory, even visual discrimination, speech language problems, allergies, emotional problems, um, behavioral issues, um, maybe diagnosed as even different traumas or um, having, you know, a, a trauma or, or, or even, um, um, you know, attachment types of struggles. And what we're really looking at is um, sensory processing. It's so easy to misdiagnose a child. Um, and so when you're having children that are presenting with these different kinds of issues, um, it's important to look at SPD. It's important to really recognize that um, that there may be other things going on and that maybe this child actually has a misdiagnosis. So when I have a child that comes to me in a play therapy process and I start to see signs for SPD, one of the things that I look at is um, are the roots of the SPD organic or are they also as a result of a trauma? So this is where it starts to get tricky because you can have a trauma that can look SPD-ish, can also look ADHD-ish, can also look attachment issues. You can also have SPD issues that are really more organic in nature. One of the things that I've noticed that's common across uh, most kids who've got struggles with SPD is that there is an emotional component, even if it is organic. So what I tell the families is, Let's do the emotional work because the emotional work is there no matter what. That way, if there is a trauma that is um, part of the root cause of some of these sensory experiences, we'll know that because the sensory profile will shift as we move through the play experience. And if we move through the play experience and the sensory profile is not shifting, that is when I then bring an occupational therapist on board. I love occupational therapists. I think occupational therapists 
and what they do and what they offer to children is just absolutely amazing. And I really believe that play therapists need to have an occupational therapist in their back pocket. Um, the combination of play therapy and OT together is just a brilliant combination. As you work through the emotional stuff, they can work through the physical and the sensory experience so that the child really has a holistic, um, uh, therapeutic, um, integrative experience. So everyone, as I mentioned, big topic. Hopefully you have a little bit more of an appreciation for, um, for this. Um, I hope I inspired you to go learn more. One of my favorite books is called The Out of Sync Child, and the author, um, the last name is Kranowitz. So if this is a new topic for you, or if you want to read more about this topic, I um, highly, highly, highly recommend that you go grab The Out of Sync Child, read about this, learn more about this, educate yourself. Um, you may even see yourself um, in this um, and learn about yourself and maybe some of your own sensory sensory processing struggles. I believe that on some level we're all on the spectrum just a little bit. Um, but this is just another lens to help you understand what's happening in the play therapy room. So thank you all for your time with me today in this episode, and I look forward to our next time together. Take care, be well, and as always, you're the most important toy in the playroom. <laughs>